This morning, we are privileged to have as our keynote speaker, Dr. Chrysanthi Leon. Dr. Leon is an associate professor of sociology and criminal justice at the University of Delaware. And she is also the deputy dean of the Honors College. So we have a distinguished person here this morning with us. As you might guess from the combination of sociology and criminal justice, a lot of her research is interdisciplinary in nature and that kind of stems right from her graduate work. She's got a pair of doctorates, one in law, one in sociology. And uh, so she's done a lot of this kind of uh, mixing studies and she's done a lot of her research on sex crimes and on women and gender studies. Uh, she's a founding member of the Center for Study and Prevention of Gender-Based Violence at UD. Uh, she also uh, has done a lot of research and developed educational programs for people who are incarcerated. Yay! <laughs> and she even has one program uh, that was, I've got a name of it here, she co-developed uh, a, social, a sociological research course sequence at Baylor Women's Correctional Institution uh, that earned her an award for doing that uh, for, I should have brought my glasses this morning. I'm getting old, you know, it happens. Um, yeah, she, the award was a Teaching Innovation Award in Interdisciplinary Legal Studies in 2020. Uh, she has studied the impacts of uh, family members of registrants, which I know will be important to a lot of folks here. And uh, she, our restorative justice folks will also want to know uh, that she is an expert on alternative sentencing and on uh, problem-solving courts. So uh, we appreciate that. <laughs> She's published a book entitled Sex Fiends, Perverts, and Pedophiles. And if I stop there, you would probably be run out of the room. <laughs> but, the, but the rest of that title is Understanding Sex Crime Policy in America. So it's a very relevant book that she's published. Uh, today she's taking a look at a topic that I don't think we have covered at a conference before. Uh, and that is, why will reentry workers voluntarily and willingly serve registrants. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, won't you please welcome Dr. Chrysanthi Leon. <laughs> Good morning. I'm gonna give my friend here a moment to get my PowerPoint up, but I just wanna start by saying how happy I am to be here. Um, as I was chatting with some folks at my table earlier, I said that I'm not unaccustomed to being shouted down when I come and give talks on the work that I do. And so I always know when I come to this conference that that was not gonna be my experience, that instead there will be engagement, there will be support, there will be questions, criticism, discussion, disagreement, all of that. But overall, it's really an environment that I always look forward to coming in and partaking in. Um, I've already been taking notes this morning. I thought Brenda's welcome to us was just so lovely to set the tone, so I appreciate that. You'll see me taking notes throughout the weekend. I'm always happy to learn from what everyone in this room is contributing. So this is my talk for today, changed a little bit from the title that I submitted way back when it was time to do that for the program. Um, unlike my book title, which I did not choose, right, that, that took me a little by surprise when um, Don read my book title, because I did not choose that. It was a little in your face, as he said. Um, if I had the chance to go back, I probably wouldn't use it. But at the time, it seemed like the right way to grab people's attention, and I think it served that purpose to a certain extent. But I do feel, I do feel uneasy about it, especially recognizing, as we all do, the power of words and the power of stigma. So I feel like I need to start with that. So this is my email address. Feel free to send me a message if you would like a copy of what I'm going to talk about today or anything else that may come up. You can probably tell already I am a fast talker. I have a hard time with that. I tend to speed through my material when I'm teaching my courses. So I'm gonna ask my friend David Garlock, will you, will you get up and wave at me if I'm just going too fast? I know he's not shy, so he'll do that for me. And then similarly, I'm happy to be here today with my colleague, Maggie Buckridge. She's gonna be co-leading a workshop with me later. Yeah, we can clap for Maggie. She's fabulous. And Maggie, I'm gonna ask you, would you wave at me when it's 10 o'clock? That way I'll know that I gotta wrap it up if I haven't gotten there already. All right. All right. 
So this is a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. You'll see in bold that I'm going to focus on some new research that focuses on people who support registrants who are re-entering. But I have a little bit of preliminary stuff before I get there. And then I'm hoping to end with my suggestions for some collective action. So that's my, that's my approach today. So I think it's always important when we are new to folks, new to a group, or when we're presenting um, what we are wanting to talk about, our expertise, that we share our point of view. And as you know, when we talk about issues around people on the sex offender registry, people come at you with a lot of assumptions, right? They think they know who you are or what your agenda is. Um, oftentimes over the years, I get hate mail, I get phone calls, things that first of all assume I'm a man, because my name is a little bit ambiguous, people don't necessarily know. And when I answer the phone and say, yes, this is Dr. Leanne, sometimes they argue with me and they say, no, we want to talk to the professor. So first of all, I identify as a woman, in case you couldn't tell that already. I also identify as a parent, and I think that's important too. I think that uh, people tend to have this idea that researchers, professors are kind of off in their little offices somewhere, coming up with their own ideas, doing their own things that are not grounded in the real world, or that are not grounded in the things that we all have in common, right? our desire for a better future for our kids. So I, I find that's an important thing that kind of sets the tone for our commonalities, right? I also, um, I like the underdog. So I chose this photo of my family attending a performance of Wicked on Broadway. If you haven't read that novel or seen that show, I would encourage you to do so. It's a really fun one. And it has a lot of themes that have resonated with me over the years in terms of really being comfortable being who we are, and choosing times, of course, when we're outspoken about that, and times maybe when we hold it back, but just in general having that secure sense that who we are in this world matters. So I've published a great deal. You already heard about my kind of controversial book title, but I, I've published a great deal in the areas of sexual offending, people involved in street-based sex work, alternative courts, problem-solving courts, issues along those lines. More recently, looking at models for prison education, um, looking at how we can best empower people who are incarcerated and provide them opportunities to degree pathways. So this is up here because, as again, I've said, sometimes people don't take me seriously. They think, well, what do you know? Who are you? And so I find, you know, in certain audiences, I have to say, look, I've published about 25 articles on the topics related to what I'm talking about today. So I have a little bit of expertise. I also feel like it's important to share my potential biases, right? And that's something that as a sociological researcher, as someone who considers myself a feminist, it's important to acknowledge the things that I do, the things that I engage in that may influence how I interpret the data or the conversations that I engage in. So here's a list of the kinds of things that I do. Typically, I consult in an unpaid capacity because I think that makes it easier for me to control my own biases and kind of pick things that I truly believe in. You'll see a range of different kinds of things, both local from my university campus and my state to more national um, efforts. And I meant to say earlier, I think this is my fourth conference with, with you all. So it's really nice to be here. It may only be my third, but I, I do always really enjoy coming to this group. And I have really benefited from conversations with all of you. Um, I, and my colleague, Ashley Kilmer, who's not with me today, um, she came to a conference with me way back when it would have been in Dallas. I don't know what year that would have been. A long time ago. Yeah, so my colleague Ashley was a graduate student at the time, and she came with me and was really inspired by many of the stories that she heard from people sitting around tables like this. And that led to um, research that we've conducted over the last 10 years about family members of folks on the sex offender registry. And we've published a series of articles. Our most recent one just came out. And we're using that to argue that people who are involved in supporting registrants really need to be taken seriously in terms of that impact. So we use the language that folks in criminology use in terms of secondary stigma or secondary prisonization. And we say, many of you are secondary registrants because of the very concrete and intentional impacts on your lives that these, these things create. If you'd like a copy of this, it's probably behind a paywall, so I'm happy to send it to you. Again, just uh, to send me an email. And I know we have other um, experts, both from personal experience and from scholarly perspectives who are here today. I think we're gonna hear from Kristen tomorrow, who's gonna talk further about this, so I'm not gonna spend any more time here, but feel free to come up and talk with me um, in breaks between meetings. I'm always happy to discuss this work. So today what I'm going to focus on is a relatively new project that my colleague Maggie Beckridge and I have been working on for I would, a year and a half, almost two years now, um, where we are talking to people who are involved in supporting people re-entering. So we, we look at that broadly. People don't necessarily have to work with people on the sex offender registry, but that's a particular interest of ours, so that's where we've tended to focus. 
we're also looking at people who are doing this work in a variety of different capacities. Now, I want to be clear, I have a very clunky term for this. So if you have a better idea for what I should call this, please share it with me in the Q&A or any other time. For the time being, I'm using this umbrella, registrant reentry support. And I, I say it that way because I want to distinguish between correctional professionals. So I'm not talking about parole and probation officers or others who are employed directly by the state. Right? I'm talking about people who may work in churches or nonprofits or other religious communities, people who may do this work because of their own impact or lived experience, or people who do it from a, a real sense of calling, either from an ethical or religious perspective. Um, so again, I'm not talking about what people have commonly called reentry workers or reentry professionals, although many of them are professional, because I want to distinguish that support piece and that little bit of distance from the state. Sorry, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold, so you'll have to forgive me if I take a break. And actually, that might be good, because I may be less likely to speed through, so David may not have to wave me down if I have to keep taking breaks. So there's a couple reasons that I have chosen this as a direction for my research. And to be honest with you, one of them is that I needed something uplifting. Right? So for my career, I have focused on sad, upsetting, unjust, wrong, painful stories. And those are important for us to tell each other and to hear and to record and do things with, but they're also exhausting, right? So I reached a point, especially during the pandemic, when my students and I needed something else. Um, I also have, have taken this focus because as a professor, I've worked with students for the last 15 years who are studying sociology and criminal justice, planning to go to law school, planning to work in law enforcement in correctional settings. And they want to make a difference. But as naive 18, 19, 20-year-olds, I've seen them do this work with the best of intentions and burn out very quickly. So one of my hopes for this larger project, and we're not there yet, but one of my hopes for when, we're, when we get it to a, a more you know, complete state would be to have some very concrete things to offer those students or others who are thinking about these kinds of careers or these kinds of callings to be able to allow them to have longevity in that work and to be able to sustain that sense of calling. And from the, from the academic side, there's a great deal of research on reentry professionals, reentry workers, and the amount of power that those folks hold over people who are their clients or who are otherwise um, under their, their case management. We know that they have the ability to interpret policy on the ground. They do that, that's part of their regular work. And what that means is they are using their own discretion often to reconcile competing goals or competing rules even, and having to figure out when they're going to enforce rules, right? When they're gonna send somebody back to prison, when they're going to um, disallow someone from con con continuing in a relationship that they feel is meaningful, right? They have a lot of power over our lives. Um, but I don't think people have really looked at how that plays out for this group of folks, the reentry supporters. So that's, that's one of the ones I'm gonna talk about. Um, so we've, we've talked to 51 people so far, thanks in large part to my colleague Maggie and her relentless project management skills. She's really, really talented. And we're continuing to talk to folks. Um, so this is a sort of midpoint kind of report on what we have found so far. So now that you've heard a little bit about me and maybe have a sense of what we're going to be about, I would love to get a volunteer. So if there is one person who would be willing to read a short poem that I have, Fabulous, thank you, Eric, all right. So my colleague Christopher is gonna bring that over. Um, one of the things that Maggie and I do with our research is in addition to analyzing the transcripts of our interviews in traditional ways, we also take the I statements. So every time someone says, I feel, I think, I believe, we pull those out into what are called I poems. And so they provide just a shorter, more condensed, pithy kind of approach. And so I would like to end with one of those today. And Eric, as you read that over, if you change your mind, that's okay too. Just, we can hand it back and I can find somebody else, but you're good? Yeah. All right, I appreciate it, thank you. So uh, we also have a, a website where we have posted some of the I poems from this research and from some other projects if you're interested. And again, I can send that to you because it's kind of a pain to write down a URL. So now let me talk to you about the groups of people who we are interviewing, a little bit more information on that. And I'm putting them into three buckets, roughly. So first are people who do reentry as part of their larger role, often a professional role, but not necessarily, and including through their religious communities. Now you'll notice that I'm going to be talking mostly about churches today, um, and that's because that's where we've started. So my own religious tradition, I'm a Quaker. I was raised in a, a friends meeting in Southern California, and that actually led to my involvement in the work I do today. 
day. So if you've been to a conference where I've been before, you may have heard this story, so I'll keep it brief. But when I was growing up, when I was, I would say, mm, sophomore, junior in high school, there was um, a mother who, whose son was exiting prison for having served time, I think a good amount of time, for um, an offense against a child. And she was an active member of our meeting, very beloved, and she brought this to the community and said, what can we do to make this possible? How can we provide support to him in a way that will be meaningful? And I will tell you, it divided our community. It has been 30 years since that happened and people are still deeply wounded and upset with each other. Um, it did, did not go well, it has not gone well since. And that really stuck with me, that sense that a group of people who were so committed in theory to being loving and welcoming could not figure out a way to talk to each other. And I've since been delighted to know that there are many religious communities that do it very well. So lots, lots of folks do it well nowadays, but I still think we have some things to learn about how we make that possible for people. So uh, my, that's my interest. My colleague Maggie has been associated with the United Methodist Church, so she was really helpful in starting our focus on Methodist pastors and elders. So you've had a chance to read this one probably, so I'm not gonna reread the whole thing. Um, I will focus on the last part. He says, as a Christian, as a person who believes in redemption and second chances, and third, fourth, fifth chances, it was beautiful to be part of that. And as you can probably tell, Clark Kent is not his real name. Right. So everybody in the study either selected a pseudonym, so some of them are kind of playful, or um, if they really couldn't come up with something, we came up with one. So the, the playful ones, people usually selected. If they're boring, Maggie or I probably picked them. <laughs> the next uh, sort of bucket of folks that I'm going to talk about today are people who do this reentry work as part of their broader calling or commitment to justice, but not necessarily within a formal role in a religious community. So Ashley shared with us, I read Just Mercy on the Stairmaster at the YMCA one day, and I had my midlife crisis there, complete with mascara streaking down my face. It just, you know, it just felt like I was being spoken to on some level. So many of you may be familiar with Just Mercy, the, the book that Brian Stevenson has written and the amazing work that he's done. I was just chatting with Maggie at breakfast this morning. It's amazing how many of our 51 interview participants mentioned his work in one way or another. And I'm really honored and always happy to be in a room with my colleague David Garlock, who's had a chance to work with Brian and really lives out his work in, in wonderful ways. The third bucket of folks that we have talked to are people who do this reentry work because of their own direct experience, right? So I have two quotes here, and I was trying to decide whether I should keep the profanity in or not. When I'm teaching, I find my undergraduates really wake up when I use the occasional profane word, but I figured we don't really know each other yet, you know, perhaps at nine o'clock in the morning it wasn't time for that. So I, I bleeped myself already. Yeah, I, I'm glad the AV people are agreeing. Oh no, oh you think I should have used profanity? Oh, all right, well, I guess I could have taken a vote. And maybe, maybe for my next talk I can leave it in. Um, so Richie, who was one of the most colorful people with whom we have spoken so far, just started off our interview. I'm a sex offender, and when I came out of prison, I knew there were people that had a hard time trying to start back up. And God struck me, and I opened a house for people like me. So when I climbed out of that pile, I knew there were other people stuck in a pile, and they wanted a chance, right? And that kind of, moment of epiphany of like realizing I can do something direct to give back is also a common thread across our interviews. We also heard from Magic, another delightful and colorful interview participant. The reason the way I got involved in this work was I was incarcerated for 14 years as a sex offender myself. I wanted to do something to make lemonade out of lemons, so to speak, and so I went to this ministry. So I'm going to talk briefly about what I mentioned before in terms of the existing research on reentry workers, and then I'm going to give examples from our findings. And then I'm going to kind of wrap up with some suggestions for how we might work on supporting these folks. So I used the term already, I believe, street-level bureaucrats. So these are the people, whether they are um, applying specific criminal laws or whether they are working in a welfare agency or any other sort of state authorized position where they have to make those on the ground decisions about whether someone deserves justice, whether someone deserves humanity, whether someone gets what the law says they should get, right? I'm, I'm exaggerating a little in terms of the weightiness, but not a lot actually. This is a pretty weighty job that folks have who are on the ground doing this work. As I mentioned, that power and discretion is really important to recognize and to help shape, right? To guide it. They are one of the least transparent um, administers of our law, right? So 
there are increasingly ways in which we can kind of have eyes on how some decisions that impact the criminal legal system are made. But people on the ground, especially in probation, parole, and other reentry areas, are, are very often unscrutinized. So having a sense of how they're using that power and discretion is important. And as I mentioned before, the kinds of conflicts that they come upon in their roles are really important to recognize as well. They can really obscure our access to justice, but they also, as I've mentioned, can create short terms in those roles, right? So if you come into something with all this idealism and passion, I'm gonna make immediate and dramatic change, you're gonna hit that wall of reality pretty quickly. And, and that can have some consequences on people's careers as well as their own, their own beliefs. And then finally, there's just a little bit of research on what people talk about as God talk. God talk as a predictor of people's being able to stick with their, their commitments and their passion. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as well. So I think I've talked about this enough that I'm gonna skip right through it. And I'm gonna go into some of what we're finding with the folks that we're talking to. So Pastor Lisa recounted an experience that in some ways was like the one that led me to do this work that I shared from my meeting. She was talking about not being a decision maker at the time, but being involved in a religious community that had someone who came to them and was very upfront about having been on the sex offender registry and wanting to participate. And how she felt in retrospect, it was really mishandled. Um, to the point that they made some decisions, sort of had a tentative plan in place, and he was so offended by it that he walked away and did not continue to be part of that community, which, in, you know, in theory, should have been a place of support. So he said, so Pastor Lisa says, so I think I would have sat down with the person first, as opposed to having meetings with everybody who was upset and worried. And I think I would have navigated the process with both parties a little bit differently. And I think that's an important thread, and we've already had that introduced this morning as well, that we need to talk to each other. We need to have those conversations. And the more we do that, the more proximity, um, the more we're able to understand what's happening. So another important area that I mentioned is the sense of role conflict. Among the people that we talk to, you will not be surprised to hear that many of them are influenced by the myths about people who've committed sexual offenses that, that are just circulating in our media and our culture. They're there, right? You do a lot of work to help bust those myths, and that's really important, but they're still there. They're circulating and they're having an influence. And they come up for people, even people who really know better, they still can kind of percolate up and cause some conflicts in how folks make decisions. So that's one of the areas. Um, another that we found is this sense of what their appropriate role to authority should be. So whether that's you know, the State Department of Corrections, whether it's a more local authority, whether they choose to be conciliatory or antagonistic. And you will not be surprised to hear that one of our preliminary interpretations so far is that folks who are depending on state funds, right, grants, other kinds of things, are much more likely to be conciliatory. And that shapes the way they enforce rules. It shapes how they use discretion when they are deciding who's gonna get their services, when they're gonna terminate a client, things along those lines. And then you have folks who have chosen to be independent. And those folks are comfortable, in some cases, being openly antagonistic towards the authorities in their community. Magic shared, you know, we don't have a good relationship with probation and parole. It could be because of a number of factors. I went to one of their conferences one time, we were in opposition to what they were talking to, and they got mad. The head director of probation and parole had a bad taste for me after that. And Magic laughed, and you know, it, it didn't obstruct him from his commitment to his ministry and doing what he needed to do. It did mean that he was no longer allowed to provide direct services in the place where he lived. So he'd originally had a trailer where he was able to very temporarily house folks. And as a result of that antagonism, he couldn't do that part of his ministry. But for him, that trade-off was okay. He just decided, this is where I'm gonna focus, this is the relationship I'm gonna have with the state, and that works for me. Uh, another role conflict that we've identified so far is between ideologies of transformation and pragmatism, right? And this is a very, very common theme. I would say it's come up in every single interview of people we've talked to. This tension between wanting to believe what we say in terms of our religious convictions, if we have those, or our other ethical convictions about second, third, fourth, fifth chances, but then the practical limitations on, on how we put that out in the world. So we have lots of examples of that, but this one from Pastor Lisa I think is important. Protecting the children and youth is a main priority, but also being caring and loving and welcoming to all people, no matter what their history is, is also part of my identity as a pastor. So I think when those two pieces collide or intersect, that's where I struggle. You know, finding the balance there. I think it's great to have policies, right? But I think we've over-policied our churches. 
Isn't that great? I really like that line. I don't know how to spell it. If you see how I put it up here, because this is a verb, you know, I listened to her, and then I had to choose how to write it. It looks a little like policed, and I don't want it to say that. I want to emphasize policied. So if any of you are, are you know, word mavens and can help me out with how I should be saying that, I think it's important. Because the fact that we've over policied our churches and many of our other community groups, organizations, many, many aspects of our daily life is an important thing to pay attention to. And here's just an example. Um, I'm probably not going to read this one because I'm sensitive to time. Um, but it's an example of, of someone who did this work because of his own experience and because of being pretty, you know, pretty painfully humiliated when he made an effort to join a religious community. So I mentioned before that there are some pretty well-documented concerns about burnout and vicarious trauma, and I wanted to give you definitions for those, right? So the, the definition of burnout from the scholars who have done research in this field for quite a long time describe it as an occupational phenomenon characterized by a response to chronic stressors on the job. Now, I kind of feel like that could apply to all of us, couldn't it? I mean, we're all experiencing chronic stressors in our daily life, in our work, in our families. Um, so it's, it's a little difficult to pinpoint the difference between that as a general feeling of burnout that people really have, especially post-pandemic. But this is specifically about burnout caused by the work. And so that's the distinction there. And specifically, it is much more likely to be a problem when there's a mismatch between the demands and expectations of the workplace and the interests and capacities of the individual. So it could be that you are in a position that is underfunded, undersupported, but you still feel you have to do this work. Right, that, that's a recipe for burnout. And then vicarious trauma is probably also a term that's familiar to folks. Um, but it, in this definition from the US Office of Victims on Crime, um, they describe it as an occupational challenge for people who work and volunteer, I think that's important, in the fields of victim services, law enforcement, and other allied professions due to their continued exposure to victims of trauma and violence. Again, that's fairly widespread, I think, for people who are concerned about the issues that bring us here today. But for people who are doing this as their work or as their main source of meaning in their work lives, it has a, a particular kind of toll that we should be wary of. And so here's an example from Ashley. She says, I experienced heartache and screaming my lungs out in a van because the Department of Corrections was playing with me and heartache at the stories that I hear. So you have to believe that the littlest thing you do could actually make a difference. And then she goes on to talk about what keeps her going. And she says, when they, meaning her clients, talk about some of the things that have made a difference to them, it was like bringing in a soft roll of toilet paper that I brought them. And that was the thing, like a year or two later, they were still talking about that soft roll of toilet paper. <laughs> now, in some ways, that's funny. And in other ways, it's heartbreaking, right? That, that people are so alone, isolated, desperate for recognition of their humanity, especially when they're incarcerated, that just the fact that somebody remembered to bring them a decent roll of toilet paper is actually, I, I think, pretty terrible. But for Ashley, it's the thing she clings to. It says, you know, I might not be able to change the world, I might not be able to roll back these harmful policies, but I can do this one thing for these small group of people that really lets them know that they matter. And so I, I do think we need to value that and hold on to that. Um, as I mentioned, there's a little bit of existing research on the idea of how engaging in God talk or talking about our work from a perspective that puts God at the center of that um, is correlated with persistence. So people who do work in challenging fields like reentry do it because they are grounded in their personal faith are associated with longer term persistence, right? So if you engage in God talk, at least according to a couple of small studies, you're more likely to persist. But what I think is interesting, and I have to thank my colleague Maggie for bringing this to my attention, is that there's actually a great deal of work that shows that people who describe what they do as a calling, either faith-based or otherwise, are more vulnerable to vicarious trauma and burnout. So there's a conflict here, there's a tension here, and that's one of the things that we're exploring with the people that we talk to. Um, oh my, I didn't realize there was a clock here. Okay, if I'd noticed that, I could have gone even slower. Sorry. So I'm actually doing quite well. I think we're going to have plenty of time for questions. I'm not, not quite there yet, but I'm happy to see that. So one of the things that we ask as we're wrapping up our interviews is what, what message would you give to people who want to work in reentry, specifically those who've been convicted of sex offenses? Uh, we were interviewing Magic, but his wife was very engaged and very involved, and she kept piping up in the background as we were talking. And so she answered this question before he could. She said, you need to be called. And Magic agreed, yeah, you need to be called. That's it. Um, Curtis Parker, another person who we spoke with, said, do it based on love, empathy. Don't do it for the money. 
cherish the minimal successes in individuals. So this is kind of their takeaway advice, the things they want people to hold on to as they're thinking about this work. Um, so as we're going forward, we're exploring how this God Talk and Persistence piece plays out among the folks we've talked to. We're also looking at the impact of whether or not people's work is paid or volunteer. We've also found that many of the people who are paid are very low paid, right? That they do this work um, because it's what they want to be doing, not because it's providing even a livable wage. Like some people are, are doing this work for um, not even poverty wages, like really barely more than a token. Um, as I mentioned, the influence of having state or private funding. Um, some people live on site um, and really have no ability to create physical boundaries between themselves and the clients they serve. Um, for me, that sends up some red flags. Um, and I think that's a pretty concrete thing that we can recommend, is that if you're doing this work, you need to be able to have times when you don't answer the phone. Uh, one of our participants, Clark Kent, I think it was, who I mentioned earlier, told a story about um, getting his kids ready to go on a trip. And he, he clicked open the minivan, said, okay, kids, get in the car. They all got in the car, and sitting next to him on the passenger seat was a member of his community who said, I'm in crisis. You need to take me to rehab right now. And kept screaming and yelling when he tried to move her out of the vehicle. Um, Later, he was chastised by his religious community for not handling it better. So again, this person ends up in the vehicle with his kids, but because they are so proximate, they live right there, there was not that kind of boundary. And when he tried to enforce it, he was not supported. So again, I think that's a pretty clear one that we want to pay attention to. Um, all right. So let me talk about some common threads that we have seen across our interviews. Um, you will not be surprised that the people who do this work really want to emphasize removing stigma and advancing inclusion, right? That's a common thing that everybody brings to this. So Daniel, um, one of my favorite people, shares, most people in criminal justice reform, they want to help everybody, except people who've committed sex offenses. And I'm like, okay, if we want criminal justice reform, it has to be for everyone. At first, they might have misconceptions or thoughts about why are you even doing this? But when I'm able to talk to them, it's about educating people. It's about bringing up the statistics as far as this population. It's about talking to them about men, not somebody that is labeled as a sex offender. And I think when I'm able to talk to somebody in person, they're able to see that passion I have, see the drive I have, see why I advocate for these women and men. It's about using first person language and being proximate. Another common thread is the sense that I was frankly a little surprised to see because there's a lot of variation, as I'm sure many of you know, in how halfway houses, reentry programs, substance abuse, um, residential placements view rules, right? How they view, view compliance, how, what space they give for people to mess up. Zero tolerance is a very popular term and a very popular way of talking about how we enforce rules, even when you're working with populations that it's really clear clinically need space to be able to mess up and have, that, have those second, third, and fourth chances. So that's my bias, right? My bias is that zero tolerance, unless we're talking about immediate harm to people, um, is really not clinically called for. It doesn't line up with our intentions. But, you know, for, for um, organizations that are dependent on state funding or dependent on the support of a religious community that has very clear ideas about what kind of conduct will be allowed or not allowed, that's tricky. And this is where their street level bureaucracy comes into play, where they have to figure out how they're going to enforce that. So I was frankly surprised that it was a common thread across most of our interviews that the people who were doing this work felt it was crucial that they give space for their clients' autonomy, for their growth, and for God. So Richie shared, you know, the purpose is to learn to honor people and allow them to come from what they need. If I say to you, come to my church, I might subvert the Holy Spirit's ability to take you where you need to be. I was surprised. I thought that was lovely. I, have, I continue to be surprised by people with whom I do not agree on a lot of things having in common this sense of giving people space when they can. Ashley similarly said, you're supposed to be with the prisoner. And this was part of a longer conversation we had about scripture and about how um, people who are involved in religious communities interpret their religious texts. And she said, in my reading of the scripture, it never says convert the prisoner. It says to visit with, to be with, to sit and be present with. And then I connect it to Brian Stevenson's big point that being proximate to the problem is the best way to get a sense of what the problem is. So I was really pleased to see that across the country, folks we've been talking to in a variety of different capacities really recognized the expertise of people in the, that are in this room today, right? That 
everyone who is directly impacted or impacted maybe in a secondary way, that you have expertise and a strong sense of what, is, what the problems are and the solutions to those problems. So I was really pleased to see that getting its day. And then finally, I think it's finally, I might have one more, but I think this is the, the final common thread, um, is an emphasis on peer support and leadership. So peer support is not new, right? That's something that no matter what kind of involvement you may have with the criminal legal system, with mental health or substance abuse issues, peer support has been a foundational piece of that for a long time. It's a little less foundational in terms of re-entry work. Um, having peers be part of the re-entry process is something that is done in places but is not necessarily woven into the fabric. And so one of the folks we spoke to, Curtis Parker, was actually the first person in our state to be hired by the state prosecutor's office as a re-entry professional. So he brought his lived experience, having been incarcerated, and was sitting there with prosecutors who were making decisions about which charges to bring, what statements to take, all of these sorts of pieces. And I came to that with a fair amount of skepticism. I asked him, why are you choosing to work in the office of the person who prosecuted you? Why are you having lunch with the judge who sentenced you to four years? Why, why are you working within this system? Um, and he was happy to talk about that because I think a lot of people in his community had challenged him on that. And so one of the things he emphasized is this importance of peer support but also peer leadership. He said, more people are coming home being successful than ever before. And there's a lot of momentum behind how do we engage with people who are formerly incarcerated. I don't do a lot of this stuff for me. I just do it for the impact that it can create in the next person up in line. Everybody gets exploited for something. And you know, am I the token reentry guy? I don't know. I don't look at it that way. I look at it, it has to start somewhere from somebody, right? And if I can tell my story to help push an agenda, like adult expungements, or trying to create more opportunities and less collateral consequences, so be it. So this sense that we have an incredible resource in peers and that we ought to be thinking about ways to really weave them into the, the threads of our organizations, whether they're state involved or others, is something that, that does seem to be taken off. And I think we have an opportunity, NARSAL has an opportunity to really be a model of that and to have that extend into other, other specialized populations, as some people call them. So another theme that I, I was particularly attentive to is what do we do to get communities to live up to what they are saying, right? So we all talk a good talk, but how do we put it into action? And how do we learn from when we mess up? Because we're going to mess up, right? And religious communities are particularly good, I would say, at messing up and then not really taking accountability or dealing with that. So that was a thread I kept kind of pulling out. So Pastor Lisa shared because we had talked about reading policies. The Methodist Church has a number of policies. That's part of what Maggie and I will be looking at in our workshop today, are different templates for how different churches, specifically in the Methodist Church, have set up safety plans and other kinds of agreements for welcoming registrants. And so commenting on that, Pastor Lisa said, you probably read in some of those church policies. We've alienated these people. And you know, they need God's grace and love as much as anyone else does. Pastors and churches, we can really learn a lot about how we welcome. And we're really good in churches about feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, but we're terrible about caring for prisoners. And that's something I feel like we could work on. And so she had a great sense of optimism. For her and for a few other people we spoke to, a sense of the awareness of injustice issues that has risen out of the last couple of years, whatever your opinions may be on particular topics, you can certainly agree that we are talking about social justice in ways that we have not for a while. And so how can we build on that awareness, that momentum, to really call into account the organizations that we work with to live out those principles and to, to do a better job of, of that? Um, one, of, uh, one of the folks we talked to, Richie, who I mentioned before, did his work through funding from a Mennonite community. And here's what he had to say, which resonated with me because Mennonites and Quakers have a lot of similarities. He said, there are four types of fuel, sticks and twigs, branches, firewood, and coal. Coal is what Mennonites are, and I would say Quakers are coal too. It takes a lot to get them engaged. Once you get them engaged, they stay lit for a long period of time. You need sticks to start, but you need coal to keep it going, right? I really like that. I like that idea that it might take us quite a long time to be heard, to have people open to these ideas that we need to share, especially in religious communities that are grappling with sexual abuse crises that keep coming up in the news. All right, this is gonna keep happening. There's a lot of pain we're gonna work through. But as we persist with it, we're gonna light some of that coal. And that is gonna be a real driver for moving us forward. And I know many of you are already involved in that kind of work. 
So now I want to move into talking about some of the sort of tips and suggestions that our respondents shared. So Curtis Parker was very clear. He's, and, and this conversation we had in our, in our home state of Delaware in the context of another really tragic shooting in our community, um, Wilmington, Delaware, if you haven't heard of it regarding President Biden, you may have heard of it as being one of the murder capitals of the United States. We have a really disproportionate rate of homicide, especially in our urban areas, tied to a number of bad policy choices that our state and community has made over the last probably 50 years. So in that context, knowing people who had died by gun violence within the last couple days, this is what Curtis said. He said, people are gonna have setbacks. People are gonna get incarcerated, quite honestly. And frankly, people are gonna die that you service. You have to understand that and be okay with that. There are some things you can do for people that it's just not gonna work out. And so burnout has been really not on my radar. I value self-care, I take off. He described taking trips where he left his phone behind. My household is good, my family is good, and the work I do is great. So I, th I think that's an important sense of stability that he brings to his work. So now I want to move a little bit into some recommendations, and I bring this to you with the full understanding that people are probably already doing all of this already. So forgive me if I am not acknowledging this work that may already be happening, and I'd love to hear about it, so do come up and let me know or we can talk about it in the Q&A. I know that NARSAL and other organizations like Once Fallen and WAR are very good at providing resource directories and often are able to keep those pretty updated and that that is a real service to communities um, in terms of housing resources, other kinds of things. I would suggest that one little step beyond that, and again, this may be out there, so tell me if it is, would be a what to look for guide that would really help registrants and secondary registrants, family members and supporters, know how to choose the right kind of program to involve themselves or their loved one in. Now, I also recognize that many times you don't have a choice, right? You just take what's available and there's not a lot there. But there increasingly are people who are recognizing housing crises, for example, so temporary and transitional housing for registrants. And there are some choices in some areas. And so how do you go about making sure that you or your loved one is situated in a program Program that has the kind of humanistic and empathetic values that you want as opposed to you know something that is going to be another prison experience because there's a lot of that that out there as well I, I would also love to see especially for my students who now having been a professor for 15 years I'm hearing from my students who've been working in the field and sharing their experiences I would love to be able to connect them to networks where they could talk to other people who are doing this kind of work so that they can learn and support each other. I know that this space creates that for people who are here, and I would love to be able to, to create something like that, whether virtually or in person, that people who are very overworked, overtired, could still have that place that they could go to. In fact, one of our participants, Ashley, at the end of our conversation said, do you want to set up a call? I can think of like four other people, and we could just have like a chat session where we talked about things that we're dealing with. And, and that kind of debriefing is a very powerful thing. So ways that we might support that locally on a broader scale. I also think that we need to be intentional about how we explore vicarious trauma in the work that people do in this field, whether professionally, voluntary, you know, as a, someone directly impacted or as a supporter. Um, there's a lot of good information out nowadays about exploring, about vicarious trauma. So recognizing the signs in ourselves and then I think we, a group like us could offer some specific tips for people working with registrants about how to recognize those signs, how to avoid them. I think that would be very welcome because those toolkits exist for law enforcement, emergency services, other kinds of groups. There's no reason we couldn't do a little bit of adapting and put a label on it that made it clear that this was a way we wanted to support people who were doing reentry support for registrants. Then another thought I had, maybe groups like this one uh, might want to nominate individuals or programs that are doing this work really well and recognize them, celebrate them, sort of share, this is a model for how we would like to see people supporting registrants. I imagine you probably do some of that at your local level and I would love to give them more publicity and have more ways of kind of sharing that knowledge and inspiring others to do that work. All right, so now, Eric, I would love it if you would probably need to go to one of the microphones. You are standing, oh, excellent, you're all ready to go, thank you. And if so, you don't mind, I'll come up there. Yes, please do. That's so right. Eric is going to read an I poem from the participant Ashley, who you heard from um, quite a bit this morning already. Okay, Ashley, I think Ashley might have written this poem for me without knowing it. Um, I am rather desperately searching for a way and a reason 
to remain alive after being wrongfully convicted. And I have until 4 p.m. in which, at which time I have to take the bus back to the homeless shelter. So if you don't talk to me before then, you're probably not gonna. And I welcome anybody who is actually interested and actually cares. Now to the poem. I think that, you know, it's kind of easy to look back at things that have happened in your life and jerry-rig it and say like, oh, there was the clear path to here. I mean, I'm not brand loyal to my religious organizations. I'm not brand loyal to jobs. I'm not afraid of change. I'm not afraid of following shiny objects. I grew up in a house where there were both social workers and teachers. I wonder how much of that kind of seeped into my consciousness. I ended up walking into prisons. Like that could not have surprised anyone more than me. It was just never something I assumed would happen. I have to feel like, yes, in order for me to have ended up where I was, it is a calling of some sort. I had been, and this may be partially personality, partly personality, like those bleep, are not getting me down. I'm going to keep going. I don't know whether that's me and like a slight bit of vengeance. I'm going to outlive you all because you're unhealthy. I am meant to be doing this. I will find a way to do this. I think maybe it's a healthy mixture of both. I hope it's healthy. I am. I do it. I see the need for it. I also am looking around. I don't see anyone else doing it. Thank you, Eric. I could not imagine a better rendition of that. That was really lovely. I appreciate it very much. So this is where I'm gonna wrap it up and get ready to take your questions. Maggie and I are still conducting interviews, so if there are folks that you think we should talk to who are doing re-entry support work, especially for registrants, feel free to put them in touch with us. We could also talk to people this weekend if you're so inclined. Um, and now I wanna open it up for questions, comments, and conversation. Right. Yes, Cindy. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Hi, my name is Cindy from Connecticut, One Standard of Justice. And uh, Chris Anthony, we met a number of years ago by telephone before you were taking your break. Oh, yes, yes. How are you? I'm doing well. How about you? Good, thank you. You look great. <laughs> That's always good to hear. Um, I just wanted to share a couple things um, based on what you've said and shared with the group today. Um, one of the things is we were at a symposium at the Yukon School of Law put on by the Connecticut Sentencing Commission. And one of the speakers, uh, guest speakers, was Judge Nancy Huffman out of Ohio. And it was interesting because we had a bunch of system people, you know, probation, parole, and others. And Nancy shared that um, probation gets their information the same way the public does through a sensationalized media. And it, it's like if I was if I was a recipient of that comment, you would think that, you know, I, I should turn all colors of red instead of uh, the mis the misuse of power by probation, I guess, is what comes through, and the keeping people subdued. The other comment is, in Connecticut, um, a pastor uh, started, not a church, because he had his ministry, but they would not allow our people in. Mm -hmm. So a therapist turns his office, we actually, they remove his desk to another room and it can fit about 12 people and they do a service every Sunday. So I was supporting that for a while. But then I thought, I'm not supporting any solution that is an integration. Isolation doesn't help, it just prolongs. 
And, um, and then someone said, well, it's a double-edged sword because probation won't let us attend. And then the churches in Connecticut, for insurance purposes, don't let us in. So it's just like a big problem. But thank you so much, and I look forward to talking to you privately because we do have a project going um, that I'd like to connect with you with. Oh, that's fabulous. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you very much. And I, I hope it goes without saying, I still should have said it. I want to recognize that the folks that I have shared um, interviews from today are outliers, right? They're people who are really committed. And so this is a, what we call in sociology a snowball sample, not a representative sample, right? We sought people who were going to share perspectives that we wanted to be able to build from. And so I just want to you know, be very explicit in acknowledging that, that people have lots and lots of experiences like what you're talking about, and that that probably characterizes more so than what you've been hearing from me today. Yeah. All right. What else can we talk about? Oh, yes. Hi. Um, I'm back again. Great. Um, I noticed earlier you mentioned the ACLU, which uh, doesn't even respond to prisoners' letters. I wonder if you have done any work or even heard of the CCR, who does much more courageous and beneficial work than the ACLU at 1 20th of the budget. What does CCR stand for? Center for Constitutional Rights. They're also in New York. They're okay. on Canal Street, I believe. Um, they, if you do a search on case law, they've taken some very challenging things to the Supreme Court. They were in Guantanamo three years before the ACLU Oof. even noticed. Wow and they send a free copy of a manual on how to sue prisons to prisoners, <laughs> and it's quite good. They sent me two editions, unfortunately. One was just before I was released, so I didn't have time to, uh, to read it. But, um, you know, they, they get about $8 million a year in donations, <laughs> and uh, the ACLU gets nearly $200 million. They went above 200 million um, during the Trump years, but um, I talk about the CCR. The CCR was in Guantanamo helping with habeas corpus for three years, and then the ACLU came around and basically took credit for everything the CCR had did had done, and then didn't help very much. Mm. So I just want to say that they're one of the very few good organizations, and if you actually have money or are looking to support a good organization, Center for Constitutional Rights, CCR. Thank you very much. I don't think I was familiar with them. I appreciate that, Eric. Yeah, I will share. I have been very, very, very disappointed in the ACLU, both the local chapter in Delaware and my attempts to connect with kind of broader projects. However, every now and then, it seems to be in their best interest to do something that aligns with what I agree with. So we, we made an effort, for example, to bring a case that would not have allowed probation and parole to require electronic monitoring of absolutely everybody that they released, because it's sort of a blanket policy for people convicted of sex offenses in Delaware, that everybody gets electronic monitoring. And so we wanted to talk about you know, all of the reasons why that's a waste of resources. Um, and so I was happy to work with them on that case, which did not succeed at that time, but you know, we all do these things that are chipping away a little bit. But I, I, I share with you, Eric, the frustration with these large, well-institutionalized, well-funded organizations that have the visibility and don't seem to be giving us you know, the payback for what they have. So thank you for that. Just to restate for, the, for those who couldn't hear him, pretty much the only good work that's ever done is by underfunded, overworked people. Is that pretty much what you said? Yeah, yeah I think we, we've all experienced that, absolutely. Yes, thank you. I, is there just, there's one place for a mic, right? So we only have to look in one direction? Okay, great, go for it. Hey, my name's Cameron, and uh, I just basically wanted to say I committed a sex offense, but in, in my, this is more of a comment more than anything. Sure. But I found that powerful, if I phrase it that way, that I've committed a sex offense. So it might be just very nuanced, but for anybody that's interested, I think it's a powerful thing if you're in that boat or if you know someone, they committed a sex offense or I've committed a sex offense. It's, if you say you're a sex offender, it kind of gives that impression that you're 
who, who knows? I just think it has negative connotations. Yeah. But it's very nuanced, and it's uh, this is the type of thing that's death by a thousand cuts to get anything momentous going. But mm -hmm. hopefully that little bit helps. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. That was Cameron. Yes. Yes. I'm not good with names, so I got to repeat them and write them down. Thank you, Cameron. Yeah, one of the things I try to do when I talk about these issues in my classrooms is insist on person-first language, even though it's like kind of a tongue twister and takes a while. So person convicted of, people who are incarcerated, all that kind of stuff. For many of us, that comes naturally, but a lot of times for my undergraduates, it does not. It takes them the whole semester to get out of the habit of using dehumanizing language. And I insist that they use similarly respectful language towards people who work in these fields, recognizing that people have had terrible experiences, that we have lots of examples of abuse of power, but I still insist that they talk about correctional officers or that they use the most professional and respectful language available. And part of that is because at least half of my students are gonna go on and work in those fields. And I want them to feel that I respect them, um, at least to the point of, of being able to have a good conversation. So I, I very much agree with you that our language choices are really powerful and even more so when we're very clear about why we're, we're making those choices. So thank you. Yes. All right. Hi, my name is Nicholas Lawrence. I'm, I'm 23 years old. Uh, I was here as a sex offender at 17 years old. Mm -hmm. I did time for it, um, did probation for it, completed it. Had two home, I didn't live in a good neighborhood at the time, two home evasions. Um, they tried killing me because I was on the registry. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but uh, I came here to figure out what I can do with, uh, about that because me, I'm a foreigner, my adopted father is a foreigner, we don't know anything. My dad gave my phone to the police, which had no password on it, none, because someone was sending me pictures, mm -hmm. doing his thought, doing his civic duty, and they wait a year and a half later and they come and lock me up when I was 18 and a half, and then threw me in prison. I said, well, you did this, you did this. And the thing is, my dad brought the, the phone to the police thinking that they're gonna say, okay, we're gonna get the, get the people, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Get the people who's uh, sending it to my son, who's under age. And they switched it and flipped it and, and hit me with a script, or I, I guess that's how you say it. Um, yeah, flip the script, I hear what yeah. you're saying, yeah. But uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know who to really turn to at this point, really. Where, where are you living right now? Huh? Where are you living? What state are you from? I live in Raleigh, downtown Raleigh. Oh, so um, you're right here in the area. Yes, okay, well, I'm hoping there are, there are folks who are embedded in organizations here in North Carolina that can be helpful. Um, I would encourage folks to reach out. I think we've already got someone heading over your way. We've already been invited to speak to the people who have yellow lanyards, so I would encourage you to do that too, because they're on the board and they, they have those deep connections. But thank you for being here, Nicholas, and for Thank you, Miss. For thank, talking. You. thank you. Cheers. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Eric Jones. I'm over here from McDowell County. I have the support of my probation office for me to be here today Great. because when I got out of prison, I went to a reentry council and gave my, um, st my story about being homeless and how hard it affects a sex offender to the point that VIA Health offered me a job. Basically, mm. they're waiting for me to get off probation, and this is they want, my probation officer sent me here to learn a little bit, and uh, when I saw that up there about peer support, that's what I'm going to be. That's fabulous. In the, in the, um, at the end of my probation, and I, I had some questions I feel that somebody can answer in this room. I want to know how do nonprofit organizations or any organization receive federal funding but bar sex offenders? That seems like a constitutional matter. It I certainly I does. On, you're receiving federal funds from the Department of Justice or wherever you're getting them from, but then you say, okay, this, you can't stay in these apartments because this. And I, that's something that is going to come up because I believe that, I, like I was telling them at, um, over in McDowell County, that the major part for sex offenders, one, they can't listen to the religious part. They can't listen to, until you, get, you take care of the living situation yes, yes. where I'm going to lay my head that night. I can't hear I can't hear your stuff about the Bible. I can't hear any of that if I have nowhere to stay. Mm -hmm. And I've suffered from that for years, just being homeless and failing to register. 
because my health start fading and I can't walk to the sheriff's office every week. I couldn't do it. So did a lot of people going back to prison just because they don't have nowhere to go. Yes. And that is one of the issues I wanted to address when I, when I get and receive my job and start working with VIA. I want to be able to address those, those organizations. Or how are they, I want to know how are they receiving these funds, but you're saying these felons can't stay mm -hmm. here. It just seems. Um, so where I'm hearing from the front, it's a, a, a HUD policy. So the, the Federal Agency on Housing has that policy in place. Now, how they're able to get to justify it, I think would go back to rationalizations they would use around public safety, right? Mm -hmm. That's how that sort of thing has been able to succeed. But there are absolutely organizations that do choose to support people who've been convicted of sex offenses. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to do that work. I'm wondering if folks who have that experience locally can follow up with Daryl and have some, have some conversation, because it sounds like you're gonna be in a position to help make some of those changes. Uh, yes, so I hope yes. we can connect you. Thank you very much, Daryl. All right, thank you. So I think I have about five minutes left. So I think I have time for a couple more comments. I'm just letting you know you're gonna get a break very soon. Hi, my name is Sandy, Hi. and I am from the Charlotte, uh, North Carolina area, so I'm happy that this is kind of local. Yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned um, quite a bit about the over-policied um, good intentions of churches. Yes. So my, um, my question is about, do we have a sense of consistency of how churches are addressing the support um, uh, needed um, by volunteers or those folks supporting these the reentry um, folks coming in. That is a great question. That's one of the things I want to know too. Um, we're, we're, so we're working on collecting that, that information, starting with a couple of different religious groups and hoping to make it a broader. You yeah. know, what, what we see in this area so far, and what I know from my other work in looking at how laws and policies kind of pick up steam and, and become uh, copied in various places, is that you, you tend to get one or two templates that get picked up and reproduced. Mm -hmm. Sometimes because the insurance company says, well, this church does it this way, you should take their policy. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes those things are actually on their own, useful and good and protective, but I think we need to be very wary of when we're simply taking models that others have allowed to kind of perpetuate yep. because it's worked for them and their insurance company puts a stamp on it, right? Because one of the things that my colleague Maggie has really pointed out, and if you come to our workshop today, we'll talk about that a little more, you'll get to read some of these, is that a lot of those kind of template policies that get reproduced in various religious communities are very stigmatizing, yep. very alienating. Yeah, and, and the, the reason I ask is because my, from a professional, I'm here from a personal perspective. My son, I'm worried for his reentry. Mm -hmm. um, the church has been phenomenal support. I'm glad. Before, during, yeah. and hopefully afterwards. However, my fear is the, the great positive loving intentions could translate into these over policy yes. types of services. I'm in the Presbyterian church. And uh, the alienation that mm -hmm. one could feel coming in as if they are in a different, they have a different color, they have a different uniform, um, you know, is something I want to make sure to avoid. Right. Now, from a professional perspective, I've worked with change leadership in large organizations and where most things about change is starting to have uh, the awareness set in. So it's not enough to know, uh, have information about what this program is, what it is, and, and so forth, but it's how, why, why is this important? Mm -hmm. You know, what is the why for not just um, the individuals within my church, but also the, the beautiful individuals that are coming for redemption right. and the support. Yes. Um, so that they have the ability to just walk in those doors free to worship. 
Well, I, I know that there are some churches and some folks here in the room are involved in some of those that have their own model policies that have worked really well. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage folks to reach out to Sandy to talk about that. And Maggie and I will follow up with you to talk about examples from the Presbyterian Church, because I know that's something we've been starting to look at. So yes. we will follow up. Thank you. Thank you. I think I, I just got my, my, my morning, and there's somebody I haven't heard from yet at the mic, so I'm going to take her last. But then I will be here all weekend, so happy to have further conversation. Yes. I always feel like we're starting in the middle. Um, because until we make everyone understand what someone looks like, acts like, and did as someone who committed a sex offense, we can't make the churches or the apartments or anyone else want to accommodate us. Churches don't want to lose their rich supporters. Right. No one wants to lose their rich supporters. And the minute they find out that there is someone who committed a sex offense, no one will support them any longer. And I always feel that unless we do this through a Netflix popular movie, mm. or Ken Burns, or somebody like that, to make people say, oh, mm -hmm. oh, he's, he did that, and he is a decent human being who is not an obsessed reoffender, then we can't move on. Yeah. So. I, I hear you. Have you seen Untouchable? Yes. I found it to be pretty effective with my undergraduates. You know, I, I don't think it hits on the same kinds of themes necessarily that you would, but I think maybe portions of that film are useful, and I have actually looked at portions of it when I've met with community groups to talk about things. You know, there, there are other fictionalized examples of things that we can uh, use. There's a great play called The Woodsman that Kevin Bacon made into a movie. It has, it has some effectiveness, but it's also, you know, a little exploitative, as many of these things are. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is a call to action that those of us with creative talents need to, you know, create some kind of um, a medium or mechanism for telling stories in a, in a way that it will be digestible for... Well, no one wants to hear what we have to say, but we're coming to say it. And Excellent. they're going to have to listen. I think that's a great place for us to end. Thank you very much. I, do, I have one minute, so if you, ha if you have a brief comment or question, we could do that. Yes, um, just wanted to make a comment in terms of the overall uh, systemic issues in our country and uh, uh, the kind of uh, embeddedness we are with cultural uh, overlays and definitions of ourselves. Um, so as I experienced my son Cameron, uh, his moral and ethical uh, understandings are at a level uh, that creates great empathy to uh, both himself, his family, and others, and just uh, wanting to tap into the, the, uh, the moral and ethical positions that a lot of sex offenders are in and capable of presenting to culture. Mm. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Very nice to talk today.